again, if this is the plan, I just ask for uh, the transparency and the details. I know these are hard decisions to be made, but depending on these answers, my family may choose to rework our working arrangements and figure out a way for my children to stay at home. I would hate to sign up for a hybrid, take up two spots, have a teacher get everything ready, only to then pull my children once finding out what their day will truly look like. Again, thanks for the time. And I would like to end by just asking again that when you determine what plan you're going with, that you be as detailed as possible so families know exactly what their child's day would look like so they can make the best decisions for their family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. And the next up is Mr. Anthony Swarbinski. Welcome, Mr. Swarbinski. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. My name is Anthony Swizbinski. I'm a middle school social studies teacher at the John Dickinson School. This fall will be my 13th year as a teacher. I'm speaking tonight in favor of face-to-face -face, uh, in-person learning this upcoming year, or at least a hybrid model of some virtual learning and some in-person learning. While statistics can be disputed, there appears to be plenty of evidence that younger people are not as susceptible to COVID, and if they do get infected, their symptoms are not as severe. Virtual learning was a struggle this spring. While I've been assured that the experience will be improved by some crucial changes, such as allowing teachers to hold their students accountable for assignments, nothing will be able to replicate or replace the face-to-face -face interaction of students and teachers in the classroom, even if it is in a socially distanced environment. I am concerned about the social emotional development of my students who will be stuck behind screens all day and devoid of human interaction. I worry about my students that are special needs, English language learners, and all those who require additional supports to be successful. I'm concerned about the students who are without reliable internet access. I worry about all the students who require the many services our schools provide in their daily lives, especially those who need mental health and counseling services, and those who are living in unsafe homes. These challenges will only be magnified in a virtual setting. If our district goes fully virtual this year, many Red Clay residents, including several of my close friends, who have to choose between work and supervising their children at home. We're very fortunate to have the option for working at home, but not all do. Most, most of us know people have lost their jobs. They return to work and now are potentially going to have to make this hard choice between working and staying home to supervise their children. We have a completely virtual learning environment. Being free of a virus is a small comfort to someone who cannot pay bills or put food on the table. And while I've been told this is a very trivial matter, matter I'm a coach at Dickinson. I know that sports matter to kids and their families. We've seen youth leagues this summer that non-contact sports can be conducted safely. For many middle schoolers and high schoolers that I work with, sports are major motivation for coming to school and staying on top of their work. Virtual learning assures that these opportunities will be wiped away. I'm fully aware many red clay teachers disagree with my views, but I believe that all opinions need to be heard. Need to be heard. I do not want to see any of my colleagues, students, or their families get sick or even die. However, I'm unwilling to allow fear to be the deciding factor in my life. I'm willing to assume the risk as a teacher myself, and I will be on the front lines each and every day. Once again, I'm supporting a return to face-to-face -to -face instruction or a hybrid model. I thank you for listening and for your time. Thank you, Mr. Swizdinski. Thank you very much. Next is Ms. Genevieve Van Catledge. Welcome, Ms. Van Catledge. Good evening and thank you for having me. I come to speak to you tonight regarding the survey results as they were presented to us. Um, unfortunately, I did not get the file sent to Ms. Stevens until late. She should have forwarded you the presentation that I created. So the visuals to which I refer will be on said presentation. I'm concerned about the interpretation of the data as it was presented in the results. Looking at it the way it was presented, it can be misleading. I want to focus on the three largest demographics. If we take a look at the percentage of respondents who were white, self-identified, it is far greater than the actual percentage of our population who is white. If you see this particular comparison, you can see that is very, very different. Additionally, it's even more severe when I look at my own school's demographic. It reflects how severely Black and Hispanic households were underrepresented in the survey results. Based upon 
The responses we had, the data must be weighted in order to reflect our population. 70% of respondents were white. 70% of our school population is not white. Now there are those who may be inclined to say if it was important to people, then they, might have they would have responded to the survey. This is not accurate and in fact might denote systematic bias. As a teacher, I have had families who changed addresses several times during the school year. Phone numbers and email addresses change as well. The number of participants does not necessarily reflect that people did not want to participate. They might not have had access to technology. They might not have understood what was being said. Some families might need help understanding even when the questions and responses are presented in their own native language. Without having the responses weighted, all of the responses for transportation use, preference for online or in-person instruction, concerns with those different models, rotation preferences, their experiences this spring, how many people work full-time outside of the home, et cetera, are not accurate. I want to be clear about one thing. I don't know how the numbers would shift if the data was weighted. It might increase or decrease the number of families in need of transportation or in-person instruction or the families who improve uh, prefer the hybrid approach. I don't know. And without weighted data, neither do you. The bottom line is that if the survey doesn't capture our district's population accurately, we cannot use the statistical data to make definitive choices. At the end of the, sur at the end of the survey, Dr. Green stated that he would use the survey to quote, help us better understand where our community stands and how we can best support the diverse needs of the thousands of Thank families. Thank you, Ms. Van Kantler. Thank you very much. Um, Are you there, Madam President? Kathy's muted. Yeah. Did she mute herself? No, I, then now I'm unmuted. Uh, I, somehow I was muted. So Miss Kimberly DeYoung, welcome. Oh, there, she, there you are, welcome. Hi. Good, e good evening, hello. My name is Kimberly DeYoung. I'm a proud parent of a third grader at Cook Elementary and a sophomore at John Dickinson. I'm also a teacher in Red Clay. I've spent the last five years teaching at Forest Oak Elementary and will begin this school year at John Dickinson. I approach you all tonight as a parent in favor of an in-person learning option for my youngest child and a hybrid option for my high schooler. As of August 1st in Newcastle County, 3.8% tested positive with an average trend of 4.5%. Of the 287 deaths in our county, all of them have been over the age of 50. I am certainly not trying to diminish the gravity of those infected or the loved ones that have, pin, that have perished, but I am trying to look at the data to determine what is best for our children. In May, my nephew went back to school in the Netherlands and their rate of infection was similar to ours. Now, the Dutch unbiased studies showed that even when children under the age of 18 were infected and came into contact with others, none of the contacted persons became ill. This summer, I have been in a great deal of professional development relating to trauma, and I can't help but wonder how much our children have been enduring since March 13th. Based on the aforementioned data, I am more concerned about the social and emotional well-being of my own children, as well as the children that have become my kids. Both my children want to return to school desperately, even knowing it will not be back to the normal they remember. I know that my feelings on returning my own children to school and my feelings on teaching in person are the minority. I understand there are parents and teachers that would be more comfortable with the remote learning environment. I believe we are all correct with our feelings and desires. Not one is more right than the other, which would be answered by a hybrid method of learning. On a side note, I ask that more communication be provided by the district, even at times when there is nothing to report. As a government agency, transparency should be a priority in Red Clay, and it's disconcerting when there is a lack of communication which only fosters gossip and doubt. Thank you for your time and hope you consider an in-person learning option or hybrid model this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Next up is Ms. Katatanya John. Welcome, Ms. John. 
I think we have the John family here too. Hello, Miss Catatanya John. Unmute. There we go. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hi. hi we my hear name you is. Now. Thank you so much. My name is Kaya Tanya John, and I'm representing three children. I have an 11th grader at Thomas McKean. I have a seventh grader at Brandywine Springs, and I have an eighth grader at Dickinson MYP. We have three different opinions in our household because we have three different situations. Um, but the thing that I am not hearing most of all is how are we going to protect the teachers? We're talking about statistics and how frequently children get infected and how well they handle the virus. But the reality is that our teachers are older than the children and they are in a totally different demographic. How are you gonna protect the, the uh, teachers that have pre-existing conditions that assumably um, enhance the COVID virus and put them in a more dangerous situation? What are you gonna do if there is an infected child in the classroom? How is that gonna impact the teacher and the rest of the students in the classroom? How many classrooms is that going to infect? or is it going to affect the entire school? There's so many questions that haven't quite been answered. And, and this is all new to everybody, I understand that. But I think we need to think a little bit more deeply. I, for one, am for a hybrid uh, situation uh, where they will have online and uh, some school learning. But at the same time, we had all summer where we could have practiced this. The kids that were in summer school could have been our practice time. And I know we have to go by what the government says. And, you know, our governor has a say in this and, and our school board has a say in this. But I, I really think that we're throwing everything in at one time without even knowing what is the safest way to go. So I'm concerned about a lot of things. There's a lot of unanswered questions. I'm concerned about the health of our teachers. I'm definitely concerned about my children and whether or not they'll be safe, but more importantly, the mental health angst that this is causing our families is, is unmeasurable. It's a lot to process. Um, I'm praying for you, board members, that you make the right decision. Whatever decision you do, do not make it from emotion, but please make it from medical facts. Please, let's stick to the medical facts. And I just wish you well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Miss John. Can and I just say unmute it because all my kids are right here. Yeah, Kylia, Miss Kylia John is next. Hi. I'm Hi. here today. Hi, I'm here today. Excuse me, let Tony put Mr. Clemens put the or Miss Stevens put the counter up, please. There you go. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm here to today because whatever decision you guys make I just want to make sure everyone gets the right information and that everyone stays safe. Thank you for your time. Oh thank you very much Miss John. And then we have Mr. Josiah, Josiah John. Okay. Um, Is your camera? Wait for the counter so you get okay there we go. Welcome. Hi I'm Josiah John. I go to Dickinson NYP. I believe there should be an option for students who lack, who are, sorry, who are more prone to COVID-19. And though I care about the mental welfare of the students of Red Clay, would you rather risk having 1,000 kids mental illness or 5,000 kids? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. John. Thank you all. Okay, so next up is Miss Melissa Ford. Welcome, Miss Ford. Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Melissa Ford. I am a parent of a first grader at Brandywine Springs Elementary. Um, this pandemic has caused drastic changes for our country and the world at large. Some things, however, <laughs> given the crazy cir circumstances, must still remain the same. Procedures must be in place to ensure the safety of everyone in the event of additional emergencies. Please describe, and I realize that there are no answers for questions, but um, at some point, I think it is important for these questions to be addressed. A fire drill 
in which hallways remain uncrowded and properly distanced, yet everyone evacuates the building simultaneously while mixing mask wearers with non-mask wearers and vulnerable populations. Also, I would like a description of an active shooter drill in a classroom uh, with kindergartners where children are not required to wear masks. Remember to keep students safe from a gunman. They are huddled together in a small corner for a decent amount of time and socially distancing the students during an active shooter incident would put them in harm's way. Um, like the previous uh, speaker said, I believe there are so many questions and so many working pieces to this that uh, need to be addressed before we um, proceed to in-person um, instruction. It will not look the way um, we are used to. Students will not be getting hugs and high fives from their teachers. Their teachers are going to be behind makeshift shields at the front of the room. And if a kindergartner needs help unbuttoning his pants to make it to the bathroom in time, there's a good chance that that teacher might have a pre-existing condition or have a family member who does and can assist that child to unbutton his pants to make it to the bathroom. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ford. And next is Mr. Brandon Bouchon. Welcome, Mr. Bouchon. I don't think he's in the meeting. Not Did you say not here, Tony? Yes. Okay, sorry. Then next up is Ms. Jackie Feldman. Welcome, Ms. Feldman. Hi, um, thank you for giving everybody tonight an opportunity to speak. Um, I wanted to just share with the board my thoughts as they consider how we will reopen this fall. This will be my eighth fall working as a speech language pathologist with the district. Um, of concern to me was the governor's guidelines that don't require fourth graders and staff of those students to wear masks. Um, to me, this is like asking the staff and students to knowingly put the health of themselves and their families at risk. It's unfathomable to me that this was even suggested. I ask that the board require every staff and student to wear masks in every grade. Of concern to me is who will be enforcing that the staff and the students are wearing masks. Um, as well as enforcing that the students are six feet apart. I'm not sure why the three feet um, <laughs> would even be a recommendation under the governor. I ask that we reopen our schools on what we must do to be safe and healthy and not just what we can do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Feldman. Next is Ms. Deshana Neal. Welcome, Ms. Neal. Uh, not present. Not here. Okay. Next, Mr. Bill Weasel. Welcome, Mr. Weasel. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Bill Weasel, and I have a daughter going into third grade at Lincoln. I had prepared a statement surrounding the unknowns of COVID-19 as they pertain to our kids. I had intended to talk about the infection and transmission rates among children that they couldn't be fully quantified as most young kids have been home and semi-quarantined since March. So how could we fully assess what would happen if they returned to schools? I'd also planned on speaking about the realistic nature of what the classroom life would look like uh, with desks separated by plastic barriers, uh, six feet apart, teacher decorations, furniture, books, supplies, taken out of the class, you know, kids being confined to their desks with masks for six to seven hours per day, except to eat and use the restroom, and how these conditions would have just as much of an effect on their mental health as being home with virtual learning where they could freely move around without any kind of PPE. I had even planned to touch on the funding that will be needed to purchase PPE and supplies to fully sanitize and protect the students and faculty. And I would have asked if the teachers would have been responsible for these items as they are other classroom materials or if the district would have, or state would be footing the bill. But all of this changed when the CDC released a report regarding an overnight camp in Georgia. Uh, at this camp in the span of 10 days with precautions in place, 
260 campers and staff, ages ranging 6 to, uh, to 21, tested positive, 51% of them being age 6 to 10. Uh, in summary, the CDC adjusted their stance and stated that children of all ages are equally susceptible to infection and that children do, in fact, play a large part in the transmission of COVID-19. Now, I'm fully aware there, that no option is perfect. You know, virtual learning causes kids to feel isolated. Hybrid and full reopening puts the kids in the classroom, but it would be a vastly different experience and would introduce a high-risk element that neither the students nor teachers signed up for. Um, imagine, you know, your young child growing up knowing that they brought COVID home and caused their mom or dad or sister, brother, you know, uncle, grandparent to be hospitalized or potentially die. Regardless of the financial threats that have been made, the reality is that there are options on the table that contain the risk of preventable severe illness or death and that these options should not even be on the table. Children are at the very least unpredictable. And to expect every one of them, age 5 to 18, to follow every precaution and rule for six to seven hours per day, every day, is at best unrealistic and at worst dangerous. As imperfect as it may be, virtual learning is the only responsible choice, you know, as this pandemic changes and will allow change. You know, please choose fall full virtual for this semester. Thank you, Mr. Weissel. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Stephen Fackenthal. Welcome, Mr. Fackenthal. Good evening, board. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Stephen Fackenthal, music teacher at Ritchie Elementary and vice president of the Red Clay Education Association. I'm here to speak regarding the action item placed before you this evening. There's no doubt that our educators want to be back full throttle in the classroom is what we are meant to do. It is also quite apparent that there is much trepidation about what this looks like and what is best uh, for our students. According to the Delaware State Education Association survey, results show our educators care more about the health of their personal families and the health of their students and their families over their own. We believe safety should be at the forefront of all these conversations and decisions. Pushing back the start date will give all parties more time to plan for how best to serve our students. We are also in agreement with DSEA that a, re a remote start of six weeks is best. We wanna thank Darrell Green, Hugh Brumall, and Christine Smith for meeting with our leadership team on Friday to discuss concerns. And unfortunately, as Mr. Green mentioned, we are trying to come up with an educational solution to a health, health crisis, but we look forward to working together for our students, staff, and community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fackenthal. Okay, and that we are with that we conclude public comment and we move to the action items. So the first action item is it's the recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the adjustment of the 2020-2021 student start date of September 8, 2020 as submitted. Is there a motion? So move. Is that Mr. Wilson? Yes. Okay, Mr. Wilson moves. Is there a second? Second. Was that Dr. Bohm? Yes. Okay, Dr. Bohm seconds. And now we can have discussion. Any discussion? Well, I have a question, Durrell, uh, or Mr. Green. If we push back the start date, which is fine, what does it do to the back end of the calendar? Or what, else, what other changes does it potentially make to the calendar, so if at all? First and foremost, it really doesn't um, just anything in terms of student time uh, for the calendar. What it does do is allows us additional time on the front end to continue to um, hear where the state is in terms of their final recommendations. Again, based on the returning to school guidance, um, we know we'll likely be in scenario two, which is a combination of whether that would be remote, uh, in-person, or hybrid. We all know the complications, as many of the public commenters alluded to, the various perspectives, issues, and challenges that we face relative to that. And so we wanna to continue to rely on the science. We were just given a DPH, Department of Health Liaison, uh, late last week, who our team really hasn't had the fortune or opportunity um, to connect with as of yet. Um, but I would like to thank Mandy Pennington, our lead nurse, and one of our, our Health and Wellness Committee for really synthesizing and going through the, the state guidelines that changes depending on if I read the Department of Health guidelines or you know, information that comes out from the state. It's been a very fluid process. Um, again, as one of the public commenters alluded to, the idea of three to six feet. You know, and so really looking at some of the health guidance and the science in terms of what the state's using 
Uh, the daily infection rate, again, really requires that it's below 3% when you look at in-person, but a hybrid model in terms of being able to provide smaller groups and settings for social distancing um, are really is, is kind of the push in terms of where that reopening guidance. So pushing the date back, one, uh, it gives us additional time uh, to prep and prepare um, for our finalized reopening plan. It gives us additional time to work with our educators uh, and support staff members on reopening um, and then ultimately engaging our families um, to, to really come up with a, a plan that's gonna, again, not necessarily be the right size for all, but one that's gonna keep our community, students, faculty, um, safe, you know, and again, these are truly unprecedented times. And, you know, when, when you wish for a snow day, <laughs> um, I think that's an indication in terms of, you know, where we are. So this pushes us back and it also aligns us with our neighbor Newcastle County districts. I think one of the things that most haven't really thought of is the number of our staff members that may live um, in an adjacent school district while working in Red Clay or vice versa. Uh, they work in Red Clay, but their children again may attend one of our neighboring school districts. And so really trying our best to really align and ensure that we have the best laid plan um, to support our community while taking care of the health guidance. So this just gives us an opportunity to delay the student start date, um, but it really doesn't do anything on the back end. We had time to- they, they don't, they, they, we make up the time somehow, Mr. There's Green. no time to make up, Madam President. That time was built into our school calendar. Um, the, the question or issue would come um, as if there was an opera, if, if there were snow days, but again, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay, great. Any other discussion or questions from the board? Hi, Kathy. Yes, I have a question as well for Darrell. Um, I can't Darrell. barely hear you, Jose, Mr. Matthews. Can you hear me now? A little better. Okay, I'll speak up. Okay. So, um, thank you, Jarrell, for um, providing some clarity to this. And uh, I'm definitely very um, glad that we received so much community input and feedback in terms of the emails and the messages. Um, and then given that we have over 650 people on this meeting now with us, I think that um, it's great that we are talking about when we are going to be starting this school year off, but I think there's a really big question out there that people are asking and they're asking in public comment is how we're going to be starting. Um, just has, have you in the administration, um, can you guys provide a recommendation on how you would like to go back starting September 8th? And again, I think based on what we all know in terms of the sciences, what are we able to do in terms of going back? We know full in-person will not be sufficient, again, based on where we are, based on, again, the scenario and where we find ourselves, the scenario of reopening. And so then the question is, with our specialized populations, what makes the most logical sense that we can phase ourselves back into as much in-person instruction as we can over a period of time? Because the reality of it is, again, whether families and I know many across the nation, across the state, are referencing hybrid options, but there are also their challenges with regards to hybrid, you know, determining um, staff members that may have underlying health conditions. And, and ultimately, what does that look like? Um, do we have adequate substitute pools? And those are all the things that we're continuing to work and to define behind the scenes so that we can have a best plan as possible to really ensure Again, that we're meeting the diverse needs within our stakeholders, whether that would be students with disabilities, or English learners. Um, again, as many indicated, um, the survey didn't capture the, the complexity and full respondents of our district. Um, and so there's a level deeper that we actually need to go and we'll, we'll be doing that in the, in the immediate future of really looking at what that looks like at the building level. Transportation still continues to be an issue with our three tier system in terms of how we have to seat children on the bus. When there's one child to a seat, you know, ultimately, what does that look like for the school day? So those are things that we're continuing to flush out. So unfortunately, Mr. Matthews, there isn't a plan that we can put forth tonight to say how we're going to reopen. Um, but we will re release that information shortly to our community and hearing the community, those that are here and those that we continue to engage with. Um, communication is key. Um, so we will be, you know, mindful to engage our schools, engage our families on a more frequent basis, especially as the timeline comes closer and families need to know and make those decisions. And again, a, a parent of three children myself, um, I do understand from that parent perspective in terms of what's happening when I have a child at each of our grade levels, um, that either being elementary, uh, middle and high school. So 
Um, unfortunately, we're not in a position to give a plan, nor are any other other districts. I just ended a call with um, superintendents from across the state. And again, we're all grappling with some of these logistics and operational needs um, to try to provide the best support we can to our diverse school community and stakeholders that we have throughout Red Clay. Thank you, Darrell. So um, I really appreciate your, uh, you know, your open honesty at this time the district is not able to provide a recommendation on how we would like to start um, but I would like to have more of a conversation and I would like this motion to include um, the recommendations that DSCA has posed to us or educators have posed to us in terms of having a six-week remote learning plan for the first six weeks of this school year. I don't think that our parents and I don't think that the community and our students um, and our educators can wait much longer in terms of uh, what's going to be happening in the, in the next couple of weeks. And I, I am in full support of the current recommendations um, that DSEA has posed and our educators have posed. Um, they too completed a survey and I believe that they had 90% participation in their survey when they came, when they came to that decision. Um, and so I, I would like to amend the motion to include um, the recommendations that were provided to us and that were sent to our board um, from DSEA and from that, from that plan. And so just so that you're aware, Mr. Matthews, we have engaged both RCEA and DSEA. So they are at the table and we are having conversations with them in terms of what it looks like, not only again for our students and our families, but ultimately our educators. And again, that is a layered process just in terms of determining the percentage of staff members who would be deemed at risk um, who may have underlying health conditions, which they are required to, um, you know, seek consult from a medical professional to really figure out what accommodations they may have. Um, so again, we are working with um, and engage with RCA and DSEA as we continue to move forward to figure out what the best decision is for our community as a whole. And, and Mr. Matthews, we did engage with uh, Mr. Stafford. And given that the reopening plan was not on the agenda. It is not an item upon which we can vote tonight. Legally, it's prohibited by FOIA. It needs to be on the agenda and be an action, an action item on the so, agenda. And, and, Kathy, was that legal advice provided to the board? Because I don't think I received it. Was that disseminated to the board? No, yeah, we just talked Mr. to him Matthews, today. What I, what I would just simply say, there is no formal plan. I haven't seen that legal advice. There is no formal plan being presented to the board tonight to vote on. And again, I. I the question would be what, in essence, would the, the vote is just simply so this. So we would be leaving this meeting with over 650 people on this call, with the thousands of people who have written into us, with the thousands of people we've engaged. And we do not know at this point for the first six weeks how we are gonna, going to go back. I do see this, and, and respectfully, um, I, I do see this to be extremely problematic. And I think that we have to be really rational about not rushing into this in terms of going back physically. And I say by our next regular board meeting, we will then have had some time to reconvene unless we are proposing a special meeting. I, I strongly urge this board not to move forward without communicating. Again, we've heard that, we, that our community need transparency, our families need the planning. And unless we're gonna have another special board meeting before our next regular session, I strongly advise that we, that we take the recommendations on hand. I have not seen that legal advice, Kathy. I would hope that it would be disseminated to the board. Um, but we, we, I think we really do need to take a stance on this. I think, and again, and again Mr. Matthews, the only request for the board this evening is to extend the student start date. That's the only request that we have before the board. It's not to decide on our reopening. No decisions have been made on the reopening. So I just wanted so to be clear. We um, won't be able to vote on that decision then on the plan until the next board meeting, correct? That's in two weeks. So that's in two weeks. So if we're, if we vote to leave us with much, much time. Hold on, if we're, if we're voting to move, let's say that it passes tonight, to start on September 8th. That provides almost a month which no, it's not a lot of time. And ideally we would love to have information from the governor sooner, but working within the realm that we have, it gives time to work on a plan without necessarily saying we have to do online. And by voting on moving the start date, it does provide that 
extra time that gives it. And I don't necessarily think that saying tonight, which I don't think we can even do because we don't even know necessarily what, what phase we'll be in or how it would even look. Even if we said do online for six weeks, there's still a ton of moving pieces that, that may not be the right answer. So I think that moving the start date and then I think the governor is supposed to give some additional information either this week or next. By our next board meeting in two weeks, we'll have additional information that we can then talk again. And, and, I, and I will say this just to the board and the community again and those who, who have joined this, if, this evening. You know, again, based on the recommendations in terms of where the state has been in terms of returning to school, there are three scenarios. If you look at those three scenarios, one being green, which would be minimal risk in terms of the virus, um, but we also know that children are asymptomatic and there's a grave concern. Do we have a testing strategy or protocol as we look to reintroduce students to in-person instruction, or are we just going to allow asymptomatic children to engage even with a mask and the potential of six feet of distance. So those are still things, again, we just received the DPH, Department of Health liaison, um, things that we're working through. And unfortunately, we, we are at the mercy to some degree of the guidance and support that we're getting. And, and again, I think we're not the only ones in this situation. So again, the, correct, the request before the board this evening is just for some additional time to push the student start date back. And as we look at you know, students with disabilities, for example, um, our autism program, we have over 20 different satellite sites across our district. Um, you know, our Meadowood program, when we look at um, five different sites across, you know, school, multiple schools. If I look at our early years program, we have seven different sites. So there's some real complex things that as we continue to await this guidance, and although it may not change, we'll be in the yellow, we need to make the best sound decision that is best for red clay and again at this point in time at this evening that the request this evening for this special meeting is just simply to ask for additional time to not start the student start date in august and push it back to september so that we can do our due diligence to flush out a plan that makes the most logical sense so that we can continue to ensure the health safety and well-being of our students while also addressing those complex needs around the social emotional learning piece because ultimately when we do um, reintroduce in-person instruction for a lot of our children and families, they've been in different uh, aspects of, of their lives. Some continue to quarantine and not necessarily go out. Others are likely at the beach right now. So for that kindergartner who may have been in the household, who they've been social distancing and quarantining, and now they're encountering. So a lot of those things are fundamental reteaching of expectations that we need to flush out um, in this pandemic. And so those are all the little things, the details that we're working on, that we continue to work on, what I hear coming um, from the board and the community is folks need more insight and communication as to where we are as we continue to wait on behalf of the state. But we also know time is of the essence because families need to make life decisions as it relates to the reopening and start of school. So that is clear um, across the board. And, and again, we're working diligently um, to try mm -hmm. the best plan, the best support that we can for our diverse stakeholders throughout Red Clay because there are so many needs um, across the board that unfortunately we're going to have to continue to address and, and because again this is such a fluid process so thank you and I, I appreciate your comments Ashley and I appreciate your input as well Jarrell um, I will leave it at this and I just think that our families and educators need to know far before August 19th on how we go back but I appreciate you all hearing my concerns I have some questions and comments um, so one of the things I think is really necessary is that the community needs to be provided with a scientific set of metrics that the district is going to use to make all decisions about opening and about closing schools. So we need a scientific me uh, measure of assessment. Then I'm just going to pose some general questions that I think need to be discussed and talked about um, in the plan. And I think that plan needs to be communicated to our community before um, the next board meeting, which is, I believe, August 19th. So I think it's important to know what percentage of our staff are considered high risk, what percentage of our students are considered high risk, what happens if someone in a school is diagnosed with COVID, what happens if an educator tests positive with COVID, and I think this is especially important in light of the fact that even last year we had a substitute shortage. 
um, in terms of the cleaning of our schools and the safety and health of our custodians, I think we need to ask some questions there as well. For instance, do we have proper cleaning ingredients? I know we have a lot of disinfectant, but one thing the custodians have regularly brought um, to our attention is that they don't have bleach. So how will that impact cleaning? Do we have proper protective equipment to keep our schools clean? And what, are the, uh, what is the district going to provide in terms of necessary equipment? Will they provide shields, goggles, masks, gloves, et cetera, to our custodians? And if we do decide on a remote learning model, how will that impact custodians, food service workers, bus drivers, other staff, et cetera? If staff is laid off, will they continue to receive health insurance through the district? Because our custodians have been working in our buildings since we went to a remote planning. So they have been putting in the work and effort. And what happens again, if one of our custodians contracts COVID while they're at work, what type of recourse is there? Um, other questions that we could ask have to do with masks. And I know other participants have, have asked tonight. So I know Carney mandated that masks are required for students in grades four and up. Who will provide those masks? What happens if students don't want to wear masks? What if students take off their masks in class? So we have to think about those, those types of questions as well. I know that in that same report, Carney indicated that masks would be required on buses. Once again, who will sort of control this? What happens if students don't wear masks on buses? Also, we have to think about social distancing on buses and what that looks like and in terms of transportation costs, what that will be. And we need to think about this, especially in light of the fact that we've also had significant bus driver shortages. And if we look at some districts, like there was a district in Texas, 80% of their bus drivers resigned when it was mandated that children had to go back to school because they didn't feel safe in doing that. Um, and I also know that the, um, the AFT has said that people can strike if they feel as if it's a safety issue. So we can think about things like that. I know bus drivers aren't part of AFT, but I'm just putting that out there. Um, other things that we need to think about would be uh, technology and technology allocation. I know that there was a petition that was circulated in Wilmington that had tons of signatures on it, and it was sent to the school board and it had to do with technology that was being provided in our district. And Bethany Long in uh, the News Journal on 2726 had an article about technology. And she had some stats there and she said that one out of every four teens and families making under $30,000 a year, 42% of black Americans and 43% of our Latinx students don't have a desktop or a laptop computer at home. And that one out of five teens can't finish homework due to the digital divide. So one question that I thought was really uh, important is, can we have the stats to know what percentage of our students did not participate in online classes in Red Clay when we went virtual? I think that would be an interesting statistic to examine and to analyze. And one of our speakers earlier talked about the survey that was distributed and we had the results that were given to us and there was a lot of disproportional disproportionality in that data we've talked about disproportionality in our district before like just at our last board meeting so thank you superintendent green for saying you're going to look more at that i think that's really important um, we also need to consider whether or not we have rapid testing for educator and educators and staff and if we could also have rapid testing for students in our schools so those are some of the questions that I think we need information about, and I think that information needs to be decimated, uh, disseminated to the community so we can be transparent. I understand that there are a tremendous number of moving parts. I also would like to say that I do respect DSEA's position on the return to school and the virtual uh, reopening with a reassessment after six weeks. And I think that if we're thinking about coming back to school, one of the things we need to consider is that we need to go with a model that provides the most predictable stability. So we don't go in and start something and that, and that we come back out and do something else. And I think when we're looking at predictable stability, some of the things we need to look at would be internet access, outreach and support to disconnected families. We need to look at high need students and perhaps develop COVID safety for them in, it, with in-person pods, meaning they could go into the classroom and coordination and communication with all members of our community in a, in a very intense, detailed and thoughtful manner. And that's it, thank you.
Anybody else have anything to add? Okay, with that, the motion is to adjust the 2020-2021 student start date of September to September 8th, 2020 as submitted. So Maria, could you please take a roll call vote? Dr. Bone? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Yes. Dr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Sable? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Six, yes, unanimous vote. Motion carries. Thank you. So the next action item is, it's the recommendation that the Red Clay School Board of Education approve Jennifer Lockheed as the assistant principal of Linden Hill Elementary, effective at a mutually agreed date as submitted. Is there a motion? So move. Was that Mr. Wilson? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is there a second? Second by Ashley. Ms. Sabo seconds. Any discussion? Yes, I have some comments that I would like to share. So before I vote and before we move forward with these administrative appointments, um, normally it is the practice of this school board that we have executive session to discuss these appointments um, and to, you know, typically we are not allowed to have discussion on personnel matters in public. Um, we were not granted that opportunity. I was not granted that opportunity. So I don't believe that I was able to ask all of my questions and get clarifying uh, points on these appointments. And so for that, um, at this time, I do not feel I'm in a position to vote and I will be abstaining. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, Maria, could you please take a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Dr. Bowen? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Abstain. Dr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Five yes, one abstain, motion carries. The next administrative assignment, it's the recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve Maya Aldis as the assistant principal of Marbrook Elementary, effective at a mutually agreeable date as submitted. Is there a motion? So moved by Ashley. Is, is there a second? I say again. Dr. Newton? Yes. Okay, seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, Maria, could you please do a roll call vote? Dr. Bow? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Abstain. Dr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Thompson? Yes. Five yes, one abstain, motion carries. And I wanted to congratulate Ms. Lockheed as well as now Ms. Aldis. Welcome to Red Clay and thank you. And Madam President, I, I wanna congratulate um, both Ms. Aldis as well as Ms. Lockheed. Um, again, welcome to Red Clay. Um, and thank you to the both schools and interview committees um, who did some good work over the, the summer to fill the position of, of two resignations and I will take the next two just to present to the board. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following administrative appointments. Uh, Dr. Hazard, Heather Townsend um, to acting assistant principal. Oh, excuse me. I'm one ahead of you. Um, that, that's the one, Bolt. Yes. Dr. That's Heather right. Townsend um, as acting assistant principal um, at Bolt's Elementary, um, effective on a mutually agreeable date. Is there a motion? So move. So move. Was that Dr. Bohm? Yes. Okay. And then Mr. Wilson, are you seconding? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? Maria, please, hearing none, Maria, please do a roll call vote. Dr. Bohm? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Abstain. Dr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Five yes, one abstain, motion carries. Congratulations to Ms. Dr. Townsend. Congratulations, Dr. T. Welcome aboard. Uh, Boltz is excited to have you. 
And so it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following administrative appointment, Megan Bittner, acting assistant principal. Um, and just so that the board, and again, folks know this is a um, split position between our early years program and autism services. Um, again, as I indicated, there's a, a huge need for additional support. So there's a recommendation that Megan Bittner be uh, assigned as acting principal for those two programs effective on a mutually agreeable date. Is there a motion? So moved. That's Mr. Wilson moving. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Sabo seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, Maria, could you please do a roll call vote? Dr. Ball? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Abstain. Dr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Sabo? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Five yes, one abstain, motion carries. Thank you. And welcome, Ms. Bittner, welcome. Congratulations. Okay, now we move on to items submitted by the board. So is, are there any board members that have items to submit? Okay, hearing none, I guess we don't have any. And so we move on to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Ms. Sabo moved. Is there a second? Second. That was Dr. Bohm. And before we go, I would like to congratulate both Mr. Martin and Ms. Thompson on their um, appointments to the board and their wins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Newton. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll do this on a roll, without a roll call vote. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. aye. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Mr. Green.